Cancel culture sure is fun, isn't it? A complicated beast that is used by the internet to keep members of the community in check and held accountable when they do something outside of societal acceptability or abuse their platform in some way. But there is a dark side to it, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Several times over we have seen situations where somebody is called out or accused of poor or even morally reprehensible behavior, only for it to later be revealed that the claims were flimsy at best or even provably false. But often this only comes after causing major damage to the accused careers and lives. Cancel culture is very reactionary and often encourages believing the victim or the accuser first and demanding that the accused answer for it and disprove it if they don't fully discount anything the accused says in their defense before they even have a chance to respond. An unfortunate tale that we have seen play out too many times. But what happens when the opposite occurs? What happens when a victim comes forward with their story, they bring their screenshots, they show the proof, and yet the accused quickly swings the public opinion back in their favor, leading to the masses to turn back on the accuser, discounting them as a liar or as somebody who must be mistaken about their experiences. Today we are dissecting such a situation, where a man was able to walk away damage-free from incredibly serious accusations. Today we tell the story of Creeps McPasta. For those who don't know, uh, a few days ago there was this, this, this like a... Uh like a, a 40 minute expose about some creepy past narrators, myself included, about this this young girl. And this was like set, uh, set many years ago. And uh, this is gonna be me basically debunking what was shown and what was said. And the fact that I said I was out for work is really one of the biggest tells for me because I was at work when I was in college. Like I started doing YouTube after college. Started shooting YouTube after I college. Started shooting YouTube after college. Started shooting YouTube after college. Started shooting YouTube after college. It's where I say I love you. Ooh. So something about me and something <laughs> my exes can attest to. I have had an aversion to that word. I have almost my whole life. Almost my whole life. Oh, apparently I sent money on PayPal. as well like I remember I'd make $60 in a Chris McPasta is a large horror narration channel that has amassed over 2 million subscribers since its launch in 2012. A bit over a year ago, he was accused of carrying on a relationship with and receiving explicit images of a 12-year-old by a user who goes by Kumori. Two days after her interview dropped, Creeps McPasta responded and everyone seemed to take his side, even notable members of his community. And after re-watching the response and taking looks at the claims personally with that creepy reading, we found that Creeps McPasta lied to everyone, and he spun a story that doesn't make any sense the second you start digging. And up to this point, he has gotten away with it, with most people completely agreeing with him and dismissing the victim as either a liar or as someone who is mistaken about the identity of her abuser. In the last year, Creep Snake Pasta has carried on with his life and channel pretty normal to this day. I do wish that I had known about this situation sooner so that I could have said something sooner. Because his lies are so blatant that most of what he says can be completely disproven by looking at the comments in his past videos, his tweet history, his public Facebook account. So we are going to go through all of that today. The accusations, the response, the lies, and hopefully we set the record straight.
On August 22nd, 2020, Belle Aubrey uploaded an interview with a young woman who goes by Kimori, who claims that she was in a relationship in 2012 and 2013 with Creeps McPasta and had inappropriate communication with Creepypasta Jr. Kimori alleges when she was 12 years old, she began speaking to a 21-year-old McPasta, reaching out to him as a fan via YouTube DMs before things took a more serious turn and moved to Facebook, Skype, and a site called Chat Tango. In this interview, we are shown screenshots between the two of a messenger conversation where McPasta does things such as asking if she is on the market, saying I love you, calling her pet names like Honey Bunny, things of that nature. There is a very clear flirtatious tone to it all. Kimori says that they would voice call together and he was aware of her age. Can I just ask a couple questions? So yeah. at, the, at the time, did you know how old he was? Yeah. Okay, and how old was he at the time? He was 21. Okay, and did he know that you were 13? Yeah, we we would like joke about how like we were the reverse age, you know, like because he was 21 and I was 12. She detailed how they played Minecraft together with him even making a large pixel art mural of her face and how she was the one who suggested that he start up his gaming channel, Creepy Plays. At that point, we we started playing Minecraft together, um, like on servers and stuff. Um, and he actually he has a gaming channel where that's one of the first things that he started uploading because I told him that he should upload gaming videos. Um, but anyway, um, I remember one of the first like flirting instances um, was, I mean, I don't know what initiated like, cause it, I suppose, like, he probably knew that I, I liked him a lot, you know? Um, and so, on Minecraft, he had made uh, a huge, like, pixel art uh, or block art uh, thing of my face. She would even go on to appear on his channel as a narrator in a few videos. At that point, I started getting more into actually narrating, um, and... I had only like done a few recordings, um, some of them for um, Creeps McPasta's YouTube channel. Um, I'm, there's two videos that I featured in. Um, one is called Jessica, um, and then I forgot what, the, oh, the other one was like a collaboration for I think Halloween or something. Though the harshest accusation was that she sent him a photo of her private and he would, in one message, make mentions of how he had kept that photo and had no plans on getting rid of it. At Creeps McFosta. Um, I had sent him a picture, um, of, like, my um, okay. with, uh, like, a drawing of, like, a, like, cat ears and, like, whiskers. And, um, I remember on Facebook, like, he, he commented about it, like, saying, like, you know, I'm never gonna like get rid of that picture or like I'm never gonna stop looking at that picture. Well, not everything Kimori claims she shows direct evidence of due to not having access to it being that this did take place in 2012 and 2013, almost a decade ago at this point. She still provides quite a few screenshots and in a later video, she shows herself scrolling through the message conversations and showing PayPal receipt emails. I would recommend checking out the full interview and video of the messages for yourself. The links are below. From this, Mick Pasta would create his response. He paints the situation as an unfortunate mistaken identity and it goes through the various ways that he could have been impersonated and argues that based on the way the catfish typed, it could not be him in those messages. Though as we'll soon learn, it's nothing but a whole bunch of gaslighting and carefully worded lies. Creeps McPasta initially seems to come off as fairly level-headed in his response. His overall narrative is that he does believe Kamori, but he believes that she was catfished by someone impersonating McPasta. And McPasta has plenty of evidence to support this conclusion. He starts by claiming that the writing style we see in the messages is not how he talks and is not how he has ever talked, even cringing at some of the messages in the chat. The notable things that really point out in, uh, in my head is the capital letters at the start and also the, the weird use of punctuation. So it's like, this one here says, where are you? Exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, question mark, explanation, 
exclamation mark crying face which we'll, we'll keep that aside for now we'll remember that uh, what's this one capital letter wait capital letter this means dot 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 capital letter you're back in the market in brackets think a capital letter damn it this is in skype xd again just just remember that for now oh no no pet's head in um, asterisks i didn't even realize that one was there <sighs> cringe asterisks is no. The problem is that McPasta did indeed talk in this manner. You can see in his comment sections of videos where he talks incredibly similarly to the messages, even using some of these same modicons and identical language that we see in the chats. The Pat's head comment that he cringes at is something that he himself said on his channel on multiple occasions. Lying about how you spoke seems like such an odd thing to lie about when it is so easily verifiable that he did talk in very similar manner. It would have been easier for him to say that this alleged catfish was copying the way that McPasta spoke, but now we have been able to catch him in a lie, the first of many. Later in the video, he would also claim that he rarely ever says, I love you, so the person in that message can't be him. Well... It's where I say, I have to breathe for this one, it's where I say, I love you. Ooh. So, something about me, and something <laughs> my exes can attest to, I have had an aversion to that word almost my whole life. Yeah, that was also a lie. Another claim that he pointed to that he said really told him it isn't him is a message in the chat where the abuser mentions having to go to work. There is one message that really stands out to me. The start of my message is this. I was at work. Now let me tell you something about myself. I've only ever had one job where I left the house. Every other job I've had, I've worked at home. I've only ever had one job where I left the house, and that was Blockbusters. And it's become such a... It's... I've... We all know what happened to Blockbusters, okay? And the fact that I said I was out for work is really one of the biggest tells for me, because... I was at work when I was in college, but I was in college, like, I started doing YouTube after college. You started YouTube after you were done with college, McPasta? So how was I able to find a video description on your channel from June 23rd, 2012, where you say that you should be finishing college soon, as well as all of these Facebook posts from after you created your channel where you mentioned going to work? Not only that, let's take a look at your Draw My Life video from 2014, where you explicitly say that you were in college making YouTube videos and holding down a part-time job at the same time. Eventually, through more hard work, I finished college with the highest grade possible. I did this whilst getting and maintaining a part-time job and keeping consistent content on YouTube. Or how about this Q&A from 2013 where you say you work at Blockbusters? Present tense. It's okay, basically I work at Blockbusters. I don't mind saying that. Uh, uh, now suddenly it seems entirely probable that it could be you in that chat based off of this argument. And how did you have two days to research this, like notes and everything, and you still lie about your employment when it is this well documented? You were working and in college and making YouTube videos at the same time according to your own words. You have now been caught in another lie that you used to distance yourself from the accusations. No one was saying, oh, Creeps McPasta had a job in 2012, so it must be him. And plenty of people talked in cringy ways 10 years ago. Nobody was gonna say that these things proved that it was him, but now it looks incredibly suspicious that he would lie about such small things. He goes back to the typing argument and he shows some old PMs between him and someone else. We don't know who and we don't even have dates shown initially. And all this shows is that he interacted differently with fans than his friends and family. And that is what Kimori was. She was a fan. So him talking to her more in the manner that he spoke on his channel all the time makes sense. It kind of sounds like he just gaslit his friend saying, oh, come on guys, I don't talk like that. You know how I type. Clearly he was very capable of talking in that manner. He did so all the time on his channel. The emoticons, the ellipses, it's all very consistent. Cringe asterisks is no. 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 
And then he just carries on with the he types different stuff. We've already thoroughly established why this argument is completely fault and I am not going to bother with it anymore for my own sanity. This makes up a ridiculous amount of time in this 45 minute response video. Finally, moving on to something of more substance, he goes on to talk about how Kimori in her interview claims that it was her idea for him to start uploading on a gaming channel. And he says that this is impossible because he created the channel in 2011 before he even started the Creeps McPasta channel in 2012. There was another weird one. Apparently she claimed credit for me uploading gameplay on the second channel. Now this is something you can actually check. If you go on Social Blade, you can see my channel was made um, March 6th, 2012. The gameplay channel, get this, was made March either 5th or 7th. I know it was like a day off, 2011. This is a, I think I've told this on stream before, but this is a fun confession. Creeps of Pasta wasn't my first avenue into YouTube. The second channel was technically my first channel, and that was, it was, get this, a Call of Duty montage channel. All the videos are gone now. They're all unlisted. I mean, I can easily post one again, or like at least show a screenshot of that existed in a time period. Now you might initially take a look at this and be like, yeah, that makes sense, except, oh, he said something completely different in the past, folks. It's almost like he intentionally misrepresented the situation to make himself look more innocent, while also gaslighting the victim. The original name of the channel was There's Two of Us, and it does seem like he uploaded some old COD clips in 2011. Except it also appears that at some point he abandoned that channel and then it just sat there. And then, after Creeps started speaking to the victim, he asked in a video description on his main channel on June 13th, 2012, if he should start a gaming channel. I thought you had already started one before the main Creeps and McPasta channel, so this claim by Kamori was completely impossible. What he did is he used that old COD clip channel and he rebranded it to Creepy Plays after he started his main channel, which fits with the timeline that the victim puts forward. In his post history, we see him say that he started his gaming channel in June of 2012. So he is not technically lying when he says that he made his gaming channel in 2011, but he is admitting all of the facts to make himself look better and make it seem like the facts don't line up with the victim's story, which is dishonest as hell. Speaking of dishonest, let's talk about Minecraft. If you recall, Komori said that she and Creeps played Minecraft together. He even spent hours making a mural of her face in pixel art fashion. McPasa starts by saying the first email he has from Mojang is from 2014, but he thinks he had it earlier. The earliest email I can find, like the earliest Mojang email I can find, like the email I used for my first ever, my or my only um, uh, Minecraft account is from 2014, which I think is a bit late. I do feel like I had the account before. This is a very carefully worded statement because it implies that he didn't really play Minecraft until 2014 when he did not have any contact with the victim. But in 2012, we can find him playing it for his Let's Play channel. It was one of, if not the first upload on that channel. He even claims that when he did play, he didn't have any access to creative mode on the only server he played on. But the only server I can ever remember playing on like that far back was it was with some narrators but it was a closed one like i feel like i knew everyone there because it had my now ex uh, a few narrators which are still around today which you know are not in the personal friends and that was that was it uh, i don't and and there was no creative mode in it i feel i think there was no creative mode because I had to make my damn mansion myself. It was bloody hard. Which is odd. He still would have had creative mode on principle of owning the game. It's been a part of Minecraft since its release. And Kamori never said that he made the mural in any one particular server or world. So him playing on one server that supposedly didn't have creative mode enabled doesn't disprove anything that Kamori said. But even then, we can even doubt his claim that the server he admitted to playing on didn't have creative mode because there is a screenshot on his Facebook of him playing Minecraft with Mr. Creepypasta and one of his Facebook admins where creative mode is clearly enabled. So yeah, that's some bullshit. And another thing I noticed is he keeps making comments like, oh, I don't even have my username in Minecraft. Like I mentioned before, I never got my name on Minecraft. So who knows if who that was? Yeah, and Kamori never said what your Minecraft username was or had any screenshot showing the username of the person she was playing with. What he's trying to do here is redirect the conversation with irrelevant information that is technically true, 
but it says nothing. It distracts from the victim's claim and intentionally makes it harder to follow and cut through the bullshit. It's a manipulation tactic to make himself seem more honest. And his arguments just don't make any sense from any point. And he's once again being dishonest for no reason. Nobody was saying, oh, well, Creeps McPasta played Minecraft in 2012, so surely he's the one who abused this young girl. And now he's just been found lying about something else that he had no reason to lie about other than him trying to stack the deck in his favor against the victim's story. And watching his response, almost every single claim here is either a lie, a distortion, or a redirect. For 45 minutes, Creeps and McPasta says nothing of truth or value that helps his case. But you may be thinking, okay, sure. So him lying is really suspicious, but that still doesn't prove that he actually did what Kamori accused him of. So let's take this one step further, shall we? Kamori alleged that Creeps McPasta sent her money through PayPal, which Creeps completely denies. He says that he can't go back far enough to show transactions, but he never sent anyone money, and it comes down to word of mouth. Oh, apparently I sent money on PayPal. And I tried logging. Again, this is another thing where they've set the date so far back that it's very hard to backtrack to because on PayPal, I tried going as far back as possible. So I was clicking, spam clicking all the months, and the furthest I could go was August 2017, which is three years ago. So again, it's, it comes down to word of mouth. Oh, but don't worry, we can make this not word of mouth at all. In the video where Kimori is scrolling through her old emails with him, we see PayPal transactions sent from jacobmonkey at hotmail.com. You'll notice that this isn't McPasta's official email, but here's a funny little thing about Tumblr. Tumblr allows you to search for accounts to follow by email address. And if you search the jacobmonkey at hotmail.com email address, guess whose Tumblr account you follow? Well, what's that? That's Creeps McPasta. Wait, this is just an empty block. How do we know it's actually him and not, you know, the catfish again? Well, luckily for us, he linked this this exact Tumblr page under his videos and on his Facebook page as his Tumblr account. You have been caught red-handed, my guy. Creeps McPasta owns the Jacob Monkey at Hotmail email address that was used to send money to Komori. You are lying through your teeth in your entire response, and this is the piece of evidence that makes me say very confidently that there is no catfish. It was always actually you, and you gaslit this poor girl and your entire audience, and you have gotten away with it for over a year. And how dare you call yourself a victim in this situation? The person who was framed is also like in some ways a victim in a different way. The audacity of him to act so flippant saying he doesn't care as long as he has his friends and family and he doesn't need YouTube. But yeah, one of the reasons I'm not worried for, for my personal sake is that the people I care about most are my close friends and my family. YouTube collapses now, I'm fine. Honestly, I'm fine. And that's where some of my relaxation comes from from all this. Good, get off of this platform or at the very least, acknowledge and actually take accountability for this shit. And to top it off, I hope your friends and family see this because they deserve to know what kind of a person you are. And just to point something out timeline-wise, the first email where we see that he sent her money was from July of 2012. And if he was already sending her money, they had probably been talking for some time, meaning everything that she says about her interactions with him fits perfectly with the dates that he talks about making a gaming channel, finishing college soon. It all lines up with Kamori's story. There is solid direct evidence that links you to this girl and proves that you are lying about sending her money, lying about having a job, being in college, lying about your gaming channel, and you're just lying through and through. If you have a real defense, I would love to hear it, but it's not in your response. He goes on for a bit about a personal account of his own character, which as far as I'm concerned is worth absolutely nothing. He defends the other person who was accused by Kamori Creepypasta Jr. who, unlike Creeps, never responded in any way. That said, if she's telling the truth about McPasta, which I am very inclined to believe, it's not likely that she's just trying to throw this guy unjustly under the bus either. Then McPasta talks for some time about other instances of him being impersonated, and I am sure that happened, my guy, especially considering how big you got in 2014. 
But again, this happened in 2012. You had around 2,000 to 8,000 subs. What catfish would A, want to impersonate a YouTuber of that size and B, be able to accurately get the details of McPasta's life, like the way he speaks, and mimic him in voice and video calls with the tools that we had in 2013. Him being impersonated some other time has nothing to do with Kamori's story. In addressing Chat Tango, he just completely denies even knowing what Chat Tango is and claims that the birthday is incorrect, so can't be him. Oh yeah, there was messages from Chat Tango. Did I mention that bit? There was like messages from me from Chat Tango. I don't know what that is. I don't know what Chat Tango is. I think I, I only ever used Skype back in the day. Hey, so while going through the editing, I realized that in the screenshot of the Chatango uh, profile, the it says my age according to, I think it was set in, the screenshot was taken in August. The, the age set was 28. I'm not 28 which means that the birth date was wrong. But here's a funny little thing about Chat Tango. You can do the same thing on Chat Tango where you add a person to message through their email. And if you use the email that we have now verified belongs to Creeps to McPasta, look what account pops up. The exact same one that we see in the screenshot from Kamori, save username and profile picture. So no matter what happened with the birthday not lining up in Kamori's screenshot, there is no way for him to explain how his email is the one in use for this account. At least not without the jacobmonkey at hotmail.com email being compromised, but if it were compromised that would beg the question, what catfish would hack an email and then not do anything to his Tumblr or any other social media? It's impossible for this to be a catfish without the victim lying, but the only person that we have been able to prove is lying is Creeps McPasta. And if the email were compromised, he should have known that it had been compromised and then he would have been able to show all of that in his response video. But given his response makes absolutely zero mention of this, I am pretty positive that it is actually him in these chats. The last major thing he talks about in this video with any sort of actual claims that isn't him just saying, guys, it's not me, I would never, is when he addresses the fact that Kamori appeared on his channel as a narrator. She briefly had a YouTube channel that went by the name Kuro-chan Fox, and we see her credited on his channel, with her first appearance being in Pokemon Jessica, uploaded on October 5th, 2012. Ming Pasta claims that he didn't ask her personally, simply he was in a group chat with tons of narrators, and simply asked someone with a female voice to record lines for him. Never picked and choose who you who you work with a lot of the time like sometimes like there'll be a few friends where you're like oh can i use you can i use you but if someone wasn't a fit this is how you we used to collaborate you'd go in the group chat and be like hey i need a girl's voice and then some girls would be like i can do it now i can do it now okay if you could do it now here you go here's the lines Here's the problem with his story. We see in the chats between him and Kamori on Messenger, where they are talking about her doing a recording for him on the 25th of September, 2012. How would a catfish know that? I mean, you could try to say that the catfish acted as like an in-between between him and the real creeps, but that's incredibly convoluted and very difficult to believe given everything that we know. How would she not notice that she was talking to a completely different person out of one group chat than she was in these messenger PMs. Also the timing, the fact that we see them speaking about her recording her voice and then not even two weeks later, the first video with her as a narrator is uploaded on his channel. That lines up way too coincidentally for the story the way McPasta tells it to make probable sense. He also claims that he had no idea who Kuro-chan Fox was personally and he just worked with a ton of people and didn't know a lot of them personally. Um, but that's really funny given he spoke in a lot more detail about Kuro-chan Fox in his video descriptions, crediting her with the idea for a video and speaking on her personal life, including when she couldn't make videos anymore, which according to Kamori was because her dad found out about what was happening between the two and made her delete her YouTube channel. It's also worth mentioning that in his own video, he tastefully crops the part where he credits her for a video idea out of the description while not bringing it up at all. The way he is speaking of her is not just some casual, hey guys, I had this rando record a couple of lines for me thing. The way he talks about her implies that the two of them have talked privately and in length enough for him to know parts of her personal life and to credit her with video ideas, even uploading a now unlisted video on her behalf, which again, how would she be carrying on a separate conversation with a catfish and the real McPasta at the same time and not notice? It's simple, she didn't. The catfish doesn't exist and it was 
always actually creeps the McPasta. And he just managed a clever enough lie to have people take his side about it. Unfortunately for him, he still left enough evidence and enough of a trail that I and others were able to trace it back and catch him in the lies. If this does not already look horrible, damning, bad enough for Creeps McPasta, it only gets worse. In the description of his response, he addresses the concern that he changed the video after Kamori's interview dropped, seemingly trying to hide his guilt. He once again omits important details to avoid addressing this directly. He says that he changed the title in February of 2020 to add the word creepypasta in order to boost views. Consulting the Wayback Machine, we find that Creeps did in fact change the title, but the credit to Komori is still there. Scrolling forward to the day after the interview, however, we find that the credit has been removed entirely. There is no explanation for this, but he certainly did avoid talking about it. Safe to say that Creeps McPasta, at the very least, lied to everyone. Even if he is somehow not guilty himself, he still tried to manipulate the situation to make getting justice for the victim that much harder and he got away with it. There is direct evidence tying him to Kamori, proving that he sent her money, he spoke with her at length, and she wasn't some rando like he claimed. And there is other evidence that this isn't even the only sketchy thing that he has done involving minors. He apparently once had three underage girls record an erotic narration that was about those three girls. And um, apparently he was at least partially responsible for inspiring its creation. Um, and Nima are on Creator's second channel. <laughs> Erotica featuring Scarecrow 1719. And me, a 40 year old girl. <laughs> One of the girls didn't even know what she was recording for, and then he posted that reading on his Creepy Plays channel. And if you start digging deeper into his relationship with those girls, you will find more unsettling stuff. He spoke to them in very flirty ways, very similar to the types of messages that we see with Komori. And these girls were 16, 14, and 16 at the time. At one point on Facebook and during a Q&A, they even mentioned meeting up with Creeps McPasta in London. There is no reason that a 16 or a 14 year old should be meeting up with a 21 year old like that. I wouldn't be shocked at all if there are other victims out there of this man. And based off only very preliminary research at this point, it might not just be him in this community. Kamori also accused Creepypasta Jr. in her video. And like I said earlier, we can prove that she was being truthful with Creeps McPasta. So I'm inclined to believe her about Creepypasta Jr. And this is definitely something that I'm going to continue to investigate. I just really hope that people see this and they listen and then they give their support for Kamori because she told her story, she brought the receipts and she was dislike bombed while McPasta lied and gaslit her and he was welcomed back by everybody with open arms. She deserves so much better than this and McPasta needs to answer for this. Do not let him continue to get away with it like he already has been. There have been people trying to get the word out for over a year now about him and they have largely been ignored. And I will kick and scream and use every resource, friend, or connection that I have to ensure that that does not keep happening.